Arriving in Ukraine, Heather Morgan and her husband Ilya were on the verge of a mental breakdown because the darknet market where they had been cashing out their billions of dollars in stolen funds had just been seized by the FBI. This seriously jeopardized their operation. Now thousands of miles away from their luxury apartment on Wall Street, the nerdy tech entrepreneurs waited anxiously for parcels filled with gold bars, stacks of cash, and fake IDs to arrive, all paid for with stolen bitcoins, in a desperate attempt to salvage their laundering scheme. Yet, as another package arrives, news breaks that two Israeli brothers are claiming responsibility for the hack. Heather and Ilya are over the moon. It makes no sense, but they weren't asking questions. For the first time in a long time, they felt safe, and they had just cashed out tens of millions of dollars. Now heading back to the United States, where they'd continue to evade the FBI and IRS Criminal Investigation Department for years to come. It's not certain if it was due to the billions getting into Heather's head or because she had nothing else to do, but this is when she creates her rapper persona, Razzlecon, releasing some of the most horrible music creations you can imagine. You suck like a vacuum Unknown to investigators, she had vacuumed one of the largest crypto exchanges for 120,000 bitcoins to create this monstrosity. And she'd often rap about the technicals behind cyber fraud. And from time to time, Ilya would even make an appearance in these videos. Life couldn't get any better for the couple posing as successful entrepreneurs. But as Heather would say, To all those sleazebags out there, you may have gotten away with shit so far, but your days are gonna be numbered. One of these days, you're gonna slip up and life will finally fuck you up the ass with a big rubber dick. Just like you deserve. This is the true story of the nerdy couple who stole billions of dollars, becoming cyber kingpins overnight, only to launch the worst rapping career you've ever heard. Raphael Nicole only had three years experience as a system administrator when he created and launched Bitfinex in 2012 as a one-man company under the screen name Uncle Scrooge. The exchange quickly became popular, being the first designed from the ground up for power users, offering peer-to-peer -peer margin lending along with other advanced trading features. You know, everything a Wall Street bets degenerate loves. Raphael now held a massive Bitcoin exchange in his hands with enormous amounts of digital assets being traded on it daily. Dude was making more money than he could ever dream of. But there was a problem. He was a little inexperienced to be running an exchange of this size. As users soared, this in turn attracted an increasing number of hackers. In August 2016, Bitfinex got hacked. Somebody broke into their computer system and was able to access the keys, which are like the cryptographic passwords to the Bitcoins that they hold for their customers. See, there's no better platform for them to target. It's the world's most natural bug bounty program. Break in, steal crypto, mix it well, don't be an idiot, and enjoy life. To mitigate this risk, Bitfinex partnered with BitGo, a Palo Alto, California-based provider of insured digital wallets to guarantee the security of customer funds at this magnitude. Customer funds were stored in multi-signature wallets that required approval from both BitGo and Bitfinex before they could be withdrawn. After years, Raphael could finally rest easy knowing his customers' money would be safe. A spokesperson for Bitfinex announced, quote, the era of co-mingling customer Bitcoin and all the associated security exposures is over. And this is where the fun begins. Because not even a year later, the second largest hack in the history of cryptocurrency, second only to that of Mt. Gox, went down. Over the course of three hours, two thousand separate Bitcoin transactions were approved from different user accounts all sent to an unknown hacker's wallet. Before anyone could stop them, they had made off with 119,000 Bitcoins, then worth $71 million and equating to nearly 1% of all coins in existence in 2016. And the theft couldn't have come at a worse time because within a year, Bitcoin would explode in popularity, shooting the value up to a staggering $2.4 billion. Now, that's a lot. Can we get a like and subscribe for financial fraud? Come morning, when users logged onto the exchange excited for a, another day of high-risk, speculative margin trading, they were shocked to find their accounts empty, but this time to no fault of their own. Not only did they panic, but the entire cryptocurrency market was shocked to its core. That day, the price of Bitcoin plunged by more than 20%. As news headlines broke, Bitfinex had no choice but to halt trading on the platform as employees scrambled to determine what had gone wrong. And listen, you don't steal from the guy toting as Disney's money lending, loan sharking duck and get away with it. So in the meantime, they commissioned Canadian firm Ledger Labs to investigate the incident and create a detailed report of the events leading up to the hack.
Ledger Labs found a fatal flaw in the security measures Bitfinex had been using. See, they stored coins in a unique account per user, and the security system required an administrator to have two out of the three security keys to carry out Bitcoin transfers. In theory, one key should be held by BitGo, the other by Bitfinex, and the third by the user. The trouble was, the BitGo key was initiated by Bitfinex through a special API key that instructed BitGo to provide a signature. This made the whole damn system pointless. It meant that an intrusion at Bitfinex would grant hackers full reign over customer funds. Exactly the thing they were trying to avoid. Bitco was likely pissed about this, put out a tweet saying that they hadn't been breached. This was all Uncle Scrooge, but I mean, come on, why wasn't the implementation audited? This really should have been caught. Now look, there's one more thing about this. It was only meant to be a thing that an administrator can do. And so that API key, it was, it was linked to an admin. And well, Ledger Labs could see exactly who it belonged to. The chief financial officer of Bitfinex and former Italian plastic surgeon Giancarlo Devasini. Things are getting weird. There's been a lot of controversy around this guy, but we'll come back to that. Someone planned or not had abused his access. Very curious. But to pin anyone in specific, more work was to be done. And Bitfinex still had the hard job of tracking down the missing funds to compensate customers for the losses they had suffered and they couldn't waste any time. Yet the deeper they looked, the more investigators came to realize how sophisticated and carefully planned the attack was. Whoever the hacker was covered their tracks with a data destruction tool. They couldn't figure out how the hackers broke into the system. The only lead Ledger Labs had was that the hack originated from Poland based on an IP address analysis. However, Bitfinex would go on to quickly refute that information, label it as incomplete, incorrect, and state that there was evidence of negligence on part of other counterparties that led to the hack. Yeah, this is just a BS statement. They were trying to cover their ass from getting sued, but no one really had any idea who took all the money. Nevertheless, Bitfinex now had to update the affected users, some of whom had lost their entire life savings. Gonna be a damn maniac to put your life savings in crypto, but people did. And so Bitfinex would publish a blog post stating, after much thought, we have arrived at the conclusion that losses must be generalized across all accounts and assets. Remember earlier how I said around 2000 accounts were drained? Well, like, of course, those were many of the richest crypto holders on the exchange. The coins stolen had accounted for 36% of the total amount stored with Bitfinex. And so instead of pissing off all the rich people who likely had deep pockets outside of crypto to sue, well, they just said screw it and decided to even out the losses across everyone on the platform. Didn't matter if you had $10 or a million dollars, you were losing 36% of your assets stored on the exchange. People who had thought they got away scot-free at first were shit out of luck. Likewise, they were pissed. As compensation, customers were issued with a Bitfinex token at a rate of one Bitfinex for every dollar lost. This was a cheap way out. Bitcoin is so unstable, they essentially converted their Bitcoin debt to a dollar debt to hedge against a bull run that could potentially make this debt, well, billions as it later went to. Except they hadn't actually converted it to a dollar debt, they just conjured up a new coin and promised with a wish and a kiss that they'd buy the tokens back for a dollar each as soon as they could get their hands on 70 million bucks. People were not confident and not entirely happy. What about our damn Bitcoins? They asked. Yet perhaps most impressive of all, Bitfinex managed to stay in business and turn a hell of a profit. Eight months later, they had bought back all of those Bitfinex tokens or allowed users to trade them for equity and iFinex. That's the company that owns Bitfinex. They made good on their promise. But for the people who opted for equity specifically, they were also given a new token, a recovery right token, meaning that if any of the stolen coins were ever recovered, they'd be distributed among these folks, but they're a very complex system. We'll circle back to this later, but keep it in mind. For now, all efforts Bitfinex and the authorities made to locate the missing Bitcoins were futile, yet they could see the wallet clear as day on the blockchain holding all these stolen funds. Bitcoin is the most transparent financial financial system ever created, after all. The only way to recover them would be to patiently watch the blockchain, waiting for the hackers to grow brazen enough to spend them, then hope to trace where it was spent so it could be recovered, or better yet, lead to the culprit's identity. And come end of 2017, with Bitcoin going on a historic bull run, raising the value of the stolen coins into the billions, it would be a far too tempting pile not to touch. 
And this is the point where we need to rewind and dive deeper into Heather's story. Speaking of Heather, let me show you something sketchy. There's all these websites that let people search breached databases. If I put my email in, I can see my passwords. Worse, I can then search by password and see other emails I use. Iterate this process and it's pretty easy to find every account someone has ever made online. Thousands of websites, including many of the biggest, have suffered data breaches and they're all here. Waiting for a threat actor to search your email, take over your accounts, send spear phishing attacks, or find private accounts you really don't want people to see. Luckily, Aura is the sponsor of this video. You can mitigate credential stuffing attacks and reverse password searches by using unique passwords everywhere. And Aura's password manager automates this process so you'll never have to spend time typing in your password again. You're kind of stupid if you're not using one in 2024 to tell you the truth. Better yet, by using Aura, they'll notify you if any of your information has been compromised in a data breach this way. But that's not it. There's legitimate services selling your personal information. Your full name, email, home address, health records, relatives, it's all out there. You ever wonder where those spam calls are coming from? It's data brokers legally selling your most private information. Luckily, there's a solution. Aura will strike these bad boys down with every data privacy removal request the EU has ever conceived. Just log into Aura, go to Vault, then click on data broker removal. I was surprised how much they removed from me. Truly scary stuff. Aura is a one-stop shop for everything you should be using online. An antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft, insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It's really easy to set up, and best of all, you can get everything at one affordable price. So stop data brokers from exposing your most personal information. Go to my sponsor, aura.com slash crumb, to get a 14-day free trial and see how much of yours is being sold. The link is also in the description. Thank you, Aura. As you'll soon come to learn, Heather would take the easy path, but it wouldn't come without consequences. The more and more I dug into her past, the more I found she was ruthlessly motivated to get rich by any means. I actually grew up in a small town. Growing up, I did not have a lot of friends. Uh, no one was trying to do the things I wanted to do professionally. Those who were close to Heather when she was young admit that she was quite the character. Her weirdness aside, after graduating from UC David with a bachelor's in economics, she started working a low-level position at the World Bank in Cairo. However, she wasn't satisfied with a normal career, dreamed of becoming a Silicon Valley thought leader. During this time, Heather was signing her blogs off as economist and writer. Although aside from her bachelor's, she wasn't working as an economist. This didn't stop her from claiming on LinkedIn that she earned a master's degree from the American University in Cairo. Yet a spokesperson from AUC told Forbes that she left the university after just one semester. This is an important trait we'll see come up more and more. She was willing to lie if it would give her an edge. She understood that money could be made if she had the right social circle. And so on countless occasions, according to her, she did a talk on this. She would use social engineering to climb her way up the social ladder. It's funny, at the end of this talk, someone questioned if she thought this stuff was moral. I think my, my end goals aren't like bad or evil. Like I'm not trying to scam someone out of money or like... Maybe a Freudian slip there. But this talk is from 2019, so we've jumped ahead a little bit. Let's go back to before her rapping career had bothered anybody. Come 2013, she decided to leave Cairo. Wasn't getting what she wanted, so she flew back to the US in pursuit of opportunity. According to a Forbes article, she was drawn to guys who were just above her level, who she could leverage for her own career. Nothing wrong with dating up, to be honest, but it's at this point that she meets a young entrepreneur who had just been accepted into the 500 Startups Accelerator program to launch a gaming company. Since his startup didn't have enough budget to pay her, Heather would opt to be introduced to investors and other entrepreneurs on the accelerator as compensation. This was the opportunity she had been waiting for. And soon after joining the accelerator, she would appear in a promo video they put together entitled Thrifty Startup, a parody of the hit thrift shop by Macklemore. Of course you know it. The video featured some of the accelerator's entrepreneurs rapping about their plans to raise some funds and looking for some millions. According to the filming crew, Heather suddenly stripped down to her bra and underwear for no apparent reason. Quote, everybody was unsure how to react. 
One told Forbes, for me, it was a culture shock. Another member added, she made sure to be in the center of the video. As goofy as she was, this kind of worked to her advantage because, well, she was sure to not go unnoticed. Helped her make friends in high places. After this entire debacle, during a brief visit to New York, she would end up in an intense relationship with a Brazilian entrepreneur who was working on a pet tracking startup. Married him to obtain a visa so she could stay with him in Brazil, but things didn't work out. They quickly broke up and again she was back in the US. Now in San Francisco, before their divorce could even be finalized, a friend of Heather's went to visit her for dinner and was surprised to find she had a new man in the picture. Recalls he stood awkwardly next to Heather as she introduced him. This is Ilya, Heather said. He's a black hat hacker. Born in Russia and raised just outside Chicago in Glenview, Illinois, Ilya was, according to one of Heather's friends, the first guy I saw who was just as weird as Heather. After graduating from UW with a degree in psychology, he headed west to California, where he would dabble in the tech space by launching a number of online ventures, including a dating site and an e-shop selling brain supplements. On the Y Combinator forum, Ilya would describe himself as a huge geek, but it was more than that. Check out this post he made in a heated debate about capital Quote, I haven't done any black hat stuff in a very long time, but I'm still interested in the black hat community from a security researcher's perspective. You do know what a black hat is, right? It's a person who hacks with malicious or criminal intent. His most successful company by far was Mixrank, a data-driven marketing startup that offered lead generation by revealing competitors' ad campaigns and showing what was working for them. Mixrank had taken off after he attended Y Combinator in 2011 and received funding from Mark Cuban. Guy was living the startup world dream. And with his newfound success, incubators such as 500 Startups invited him to become a mentor and share his expertise with new founders. And it's during one of his speeches that he would meet Heather, a girl that listened, admired, and interacted. Might have been the first girl to ever give him attention. I I'm not sure. Fast forward a few months down the line, right after her breakup, the two would move in together. And now with Ilya serving as an advisor, Heather would launch her own startup, Salesfolk, which offer companies cold email marketing campaigns. Pretty soon, the two would start to travel the world together, going to exotic destinations like Hong Kong, Panama, Mexico, you name it. Within a year, it seemed like Ilya and Heather had finally found the secret sauce for their businesses. However, all of a sudden, in 2015, Heather would start firing her employees at Salesfolk left and right, many of them close friends. It was like something really bad was going on behind the scenes. At the same time, Ilya slowly withdrew from his professional responsibilities, and by May 2016, just a few months before the Bitfinex hack, he would completely leave his startup, even though its revenue was growing at an all-time high. According to one of Mixrank's staff, we were all trying to figure out why did he walk away now. We were doing really well. Our revenue was jumping pretty quickly. Things weren't making a lot of sense in the couple's life to the outside world, but soon Heather would be back online in a more public way than ever. Come January 2017, with the smoke from New Year's fireworks still in the air, investigators finally got what they were waiting for, movement on the blockchain. Someone had begun cashing out the Bitfinex stash account. They now faced the daunting task of following the money through the blockchain in hopes it would lead back to the thief's identity. Investigators saw someone had started sending small amounts of Bitcoin zigzagging through multiple accounts before landing in Alpha Bay, a dark web marketplace used to transact drugs, weapons, and other illicit goods. The market's mixing protocols made it virtually impossible for the authorities to follow the money. Whoever was cashing out was smart enough to know they had to be careful about the trail they left on the blockchain to avoid getting caught. Alphabay served as what could only be described as a huge information black hole for the online underworld, with thousands of cybercriminals having a money laundering frenzy. And it would remain like that if, in July 2017, Alphabay was not shut down by law enforcement during an operation to bust dark web markets. We'll talk about the guy who was running this website, Alexander Craze, in another video, so make sure you subscribe. All of a sudden, with the marketplace offline, the laundering frenzy had come to a grinding halt. And it was about time for law enforcement to start looking through Alpha Bay's files to start prosecuting, but there were thousands of drug dealers and gun smugglers they had to take care of first. It's around this time that Heather started writing for Forbes. Actually, in that talk on social engineering, she says she sleezed her way into getting a column on Forbes, but that's not what I'm interested in. Check out her bio. She describes herself as an international economist, serial entrepreneur, investor, and and an expert in persuasion, social engineering, and game theory when she's not reverse engineering black markets to think of better ways to combat fraud and cybercrime. She was like proud of this stuff. 
I don't know what conclusions you can draw here, but many of the cyber criminals I cover get caught because they feel like their crimes are a real accomplishment, and they want the attention and admiration that comes with achievements. But they can't talk about what they've done because it's illegal, and so they do stuff like this. Make up a kind of fake but kind of true identity in an effort to fill their esteem needs. During a sales folk presentation, she even claimed that her company had generated $64.7 million in revenue during 2016, a figure oddly similar to the value of bitcoins at the time of the hack. With Alpha Bay gone, investigators noticed a new technique being used to obscure where the crypto was being cashed out. At the time, the most state-of-the-art laundering technique was coin joins. Think of it this way. The blockchain is a public record of every transaction. Anyone can see it. So by combining multiple people's coins into a single address, then redistributing it, well, you might have known who originally sent the coins in, but there'd be a question about which address they went back out to. Doing this with lots and lots of people involved makes the money hard to follow. The hackers, apparently feeling secure in this method, would then cash out their loot into more traditional financial accounts. But part of the trouble is, especially when doing large amounts, it becomes trivial, even with coin joins to follow the money. Just see who sent in the largest pile and where it comes out. Not many people are putting big money into coin joins. And so investigators noticed another technique being used, chain hopping. That's trading Bitcoin for other cryptocurrencies, usually rapidly in an effort to break the link. However, at the same time, researchers started to evolve and build more sophisticated blockchain analysis tools to combat the effectiveness of these techniques. Chain Analysis is one of these blockchain tracing companies, and just to give you an idea, they're valued at $8.6 billion. There's a huge amount of money in providing a service that's able to trace illicit funds across blockchains. And the trouble is, these blockchains are forever. It would only be a matter of time before investigators would catch up and untangle the carefully spun web of transactions. For now, the stakes were becoming higher than ever. In December 2017, Bitcoin peaked at $20,000, making the amount stolen worth more than $4 billion. Yet efforts by Bitfinex and authorities to recover the Bitcoins even after them being laundered were futile, and it remained this way for years. Till June 2019, when dramatic news broke that two brothers were arrested on suspicion of being involved in the hack, along with some other phishing schemes. The police allegedly seized two luxury cars along with a hardware wallet, but upon investigation, it did not contain any funds stolen from Bitfinex. They seemed to run a scheme where they would lure Reddit and Telegram users onto a fake website that was designed to look like a real crypto exchange to steal their coins. However, at the hearing, one of the brothers confessed to his involvement in the Bitfinex hack, adding quote, I was wrong, I came from a bad place, I'm a good boy, and I'm sorry, I'm willing to cooperate. Things now started to become absurd. Why are these brothers pleading guilty when they hold no funds related to the hack? That was not strange enough. Just two months after the arrest of the brothers, Heather would post her location on social media. She was in Kiev, Ukraine, accepting packages from darknet vendors. They were literally on a trip abroad to launder their stolen Bitcoins, and yet there was two brothers taking the fall. What the hell is going on here? The trip seemed to have worked. Nearly 25,000 coins had been sold off, worth tens of millions of dollars. They were rich beyond their wildest dreams, and they still had the majority of the coins sitting safely in the wallet untouched. And the Bitfinex victims who believed that the story would end with the capture of the brothers were sad to find out while they had stolen millions through creating fake crypto exchanges and tricking people into using them, they had no connection to the Bitfinex act. The river had run dry again. By now, it's not certain if it was due to the billions getting into Heather's head or because she had nothing else to do, but this is when she creates her rapper persona, Razzlecon, releasing some of the most horrible music creations you could imagine. What's up, Razzlecon here? Like. Genghis Khan with Morphin To quote her website, just like her fearless entrepreneurial spirit and hacker mindset, Raz shamelessly explores new frontiers of art. The song is for the and By this time, they had moved into a luxury apartment on Wall Street, and so she starts calling herself the crocodile of Wall Street. Bitch, I'm the motherfucking crocodile of Wall Street! Wall Street! There's a lot of nonsense. Sunday school with Charlie! Sunday school with Charlie! Have yourself a ham and a pie! Hey! Hi! Ho! Who? Charlie's gonna come for you! I had to watch everything she ever uploaded to make this video. She basically wanted to paint herself as a hacker, economist, misfit, entrepreneur, all at the same time. Like a vacuum cleaner. 
unknown to investigators, she vacuumed Bitfinex to create this. And often, she'd rap about the technicals behind cyber fraud. And at the end of this one, well, maybe she was a little self-conscious. To all those sleaze bags out there, you may have gotten away with shit so far, but your days are gonna be numbered. One of these days, you're gonna slip up, and life will finally f*** you up the ass with a big rubber d just like you deserve. And from time to time, Ilya would even make an appearance in these videos. And this one, she's teasing him for eating cat food. I taste all her cat food. I tasted her cheeky cat and I'm like, this is pretty good. It needs salt, it needs pepper. And while he was never a very animated participant, to say the least. I love you, I support you, but I don't want to be involved. Life was passing by like this with Ilya and Heather planning to get married. Back in June of 2019, he had proposed by renting out billboards all over New York to promote her rap. And now, come 2021, it was about time to get married and no expense would be spared. But ahead of the big day, investigators again detected bitcoins being moved from the flagged wallets. Over the next two months, more than 3,500 of the stolen coins worth an estimated $39 million moved in a series of transactions. And this was making headlines. Lines. Shit, there was Twitter bots set up to track these transfers. The world knew that the hackers were still out there trying to offload their billions slowly by tens of millions of dollars at a time. Yet, over 80% of the stolen funds still remained in the original wallet. With this revelation, Bitfinex decided to raise the stakes. They posted a reward for information on the hackers, even making a controversial statement that the hackers themselves will be rewarded if they return the stolen funds. More specifically, saying that under the program, the hacker could get up to $400 million if all the coins are returned. The hackers were instructed to make a small transfer from the wallet address connected with the hack to one controlled by Bitfinex to initiate the deal. But as you may have figured, this would never happen. However, investigators were finally working their way through Alphabay's seized files. During the Alphabay shutdown, investigators got their hands on the Darknet market's internal transaction logs. Its mixing protocols, which previously created a black hole, had suddenly brightened up. They could now trace where funds ended up after being mixed through the website. Still, it's a rigorous task to link Bitcoin addresses to actual people. But after cross-referencing many of the data points, officials began to find some links to shell companies and bank accounts that the funds were being cashed out to. And they belonged to none other than Heather and Ilya. So at this point, they began watching the couple, collecting evidence to build a strong case against them. Yet to everyone else, things seemed normal. They were business owners. After all, there was some explanation for all the money. Ilya had started a new company, Enpass, where they were creating a privacy-focused crypto wallet. I wonder why a crypto-based startup focused on privacy would be useful to him. Any hunches? Might be easy to mix billions of dollars in Bitcoin if you've got thousands of users to hide behind and complete control over the wallet's mixing protocols. I think that was probably his master plan. And in the meantime, the dude was going to be cheap applied for an $11,000 grant through the Paycheck Protection Program designed to save jobs in the early days of the pandemic. Truly no shame. Just weeks later, investigators watching the couple found Bitcoins linked to the hack were used to buy, among other things, a $500 Walmart gift card on which purchases were made under Heather's name. Come 2022, they would have known something was up because their internet service provider gave them a notification that their internet traffic had been subpoenaed. For some reason, the ISP wasn't issue a gag order. This type of thing could jeopardize the entire operation. They could start destroying evidence or begin planning an escape. The authorities were now inches away from getting them. The only thing left to do was raid their apartment in hopes of catching them red-handed with evidence. But first, they would get married, perhaps the most eccentric wedding I have ever seen. But for the Bonnie and Clyde of crypto, well, they were truly about to put their vows to the test because when they got back, that was it for the couple. FBI and IRS agents bust into the apartment. Their biggest hope was that they could recover the coins. In a last ditch effort, Heather told the agents she wanted to grab her cat then sprint it off to another room. Quickly chasing her, an agent noticed that she was going for her phone, trying to lock it. She was stopped on the spot. The jig was up. 
They found hidden and hollowed out books, fake passports, burner phones, $40,000 in cash, and evidence the couple was planning to flee, likely to Russia, one of the only countries impenetrable to Western law enforcement. Ilya was a dual citizen, after all. By the end of the month, the feds had obtained a search warrant for a cloud storage account belonging to Ilya, where they found a list of wallets linked to the hack with their passwords. One of those wallets stored the majority of the remaining money, 94,000 bitcoins. Using Ilya's password, they entered the account and took the funds, marking the largest seizure in the Department of Justice history. $3.6 billion, thanks to Bitcoin's astronomical appreciation. The department has charged Ilya Lichtenstein and Heather Morgan for their alleged roles in a conspiracy to launder stolen cryptocurrency taken during the 2016 hack of a virtual currency exchange. Ilya, now sitting in a jail cell, was ruled a flight risk. The judge noting that he had the skills needed to launder the stolen funds and make the required arrangements to flee the country, while Heather was set free on a $3 million bond, posting her parents' home as collateral. More interesting, investigators told the judge that they never found any evidence that the couple actually committed the hack. All they had was the sprawling network of accounts through which the pair was working to launder the funds. Likewise, they were facing charges on conspiracy to commit money laundering, as well as to defraud the United States because well, taxes are due even on a gains. They were facing a maximum sentence of 25 years behind bars. However, on July 21st, 2023, they both agreed to enter into a plea deal. Ilya pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit money laundering, which carries a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison. Heather was in attendance when he pled guilty. He smiled at her and blew her a kiss during a moment of eye contact. It was the first time they had seen each other in more than a year. She would go on to plead guilty to one count of money laundering and one count of conspiracy to defraud the United States, each of which carries a maximum penalty of five years in prison. The sentencing hearing has yet to be set. Before getting caught on her Facebook, Heather had left a thought, quote, with words and software, you can write your own destiny. As for the stolen funds, there's currently a fight over who's to get them. Of course, Bitfinex is claiming ownership, but also many of the users who were later reimbursed are claiming ownership over their share of the coins. It's likely they'll be distributed to creditors if they can prove they own them leading up to the hack, you know, produce receipts and things like this. But now being in the hands of the government, we might all be dead before a system like that is finalized. The only question now is, what was the second largest seizure in the Department of Justice history? Well, that would be this guy on screen screen right now, and some would say that he didn't deserve to have his coins taken away. 